thanks for the introduction and, and uh, thanks for coming here. So, yeah, sorry for the four. I think I don't even have the logos of the institutions you mentioned yeah, because you mentioned INSERM. Like yeah, but I, I, forgot, <laughs> I forgot the logo, sorry. <laughs> no, the reason why there are so many uh, logos here is just that physically I just work in the same place, in the same street, we do. But let's say that uh, ENS is more in the math CS domain. Institute Curie is a hospital and research center uh, with biology. And Mines Paris Tech is computational biology. So I try to work at the interface of these, uh, of these domains. All right, so, so uh, my, my talk may be a little bit different from many of the talks this week. I'm not a biologist for sure. Uh, what I would like to discuss is more some, um, some difficulties we have when we deal with uh, genomic data. And, and how we try to uh, overcos overcome some of them. And more, more, more particularly, I will talk of how can we do inference, how can we learn from genomic data, because it seems to make sense nowadays to, when we want to study biology to generate data, we generate lots of data and we say, well, from the data we're going to learn something. And I will discuss this, this problem of learning from data and, and why it's not so obvious. And to be concrete, I will just, you know, it's a session about health, uh, I will motivate my applications with some um, health applications, in particular in personalized or precision medicine, uh, for example in cancer. So there is a view that nowadays we can improve the way we, we manage the disease and we treat patients by uh, capturing lots of data about each individual. So someone with a cancer, we can now sequence the person, read the genome of the tumor, read the genome of the person, measure proteins, do imaging, so we can collect lots of data about each individual and by looking at the data we can observe that there is a big diversity among cancers not two persons have the same cancer at the molecular level so maybe by analyzing all these very precise data we can predict or suggest specific treatments specific ways to uh, to approach the disease and for example give different drugs or different treatments to different persons based on, on their molecular profiles Okay, so th there has been some success in that without going to, you know, all the full genome sequencing. It's well known that some markers, like the expression of some proteins, sometimes is predictive for the response to some treatment. So this is used in the hospital already. And what we would like to do overall is to go a bit further, not look at one or two proteins, but maybe look at the full genome, look at the full images, look at the full protein, and end up with, let's say, algorithms that would take these data as input and make a suggestion of a treatment to give. Okay, so the difficulty here is that uh, we don't know what should be the algorithm. You know, if, if, I mean, if I give you all this data and ask you what drug should you give, it's not obvious. We have some knowledge, but it's very partial. And so we would like to automatize the process and design algorithms or programs that would do something automatically. And the way uh, science proceeds these days is to say maybe you can just collect lots of data about many people, observe, you know, how the disease behaves or the response to different therapies and try to find associations, correlations between what we measure and the fact that some drugs work or not, for example. And then if we capture some association, maybe we can say that based on what we have observed in large cohorts of patients on clinical trials, for example, then we can suggest that for example, people who express a particular protein or people with particular mutations tend to respond well to the blue drug and therefore we can suggest that the people should be given the blue drug. Okay, so it makes sense to, to, to have this approach. And so this is typically a machine, uh, you know, what we call machine learning approach or statistical approach where we are not sure to understand why the blue drug would work, but just from empirical observations, we can find some association between what we measure as input and, and what the, the output is, right? So the, the way, so I'm going to talk about this process of how to design an algorithm that would decide what to suggest as output from the input. So what, what drug should we give from the, let's say, genomic information. And more precisely, how this algorithm can be designed by analyzing lots of data where we have collected information about patients and the corresponding uh, response. Now, statistically speaking, it's, very, it's a very standard and classical problem called regression or classification. And for example, in, in a textbook in, in statistics or machine learning, you, you often see these kind of pictures where uh, this is a, you know, abstraction of the problem or what you would say, 
the problem we have to solve is the following. We have collected data about a number of patients with cancer. Let's say we have given them some blue drugs and we have observed that sometimes the drug works and sometimes it doesn't work. Then what we want to learn or to infer is a rule that would predict the effectiveness of the drug from the input, right? So mathematically or visually you can imagine that uh, you know, you have points where each point would be a patient here. The position of a point, I plot it in, in two dimensions here, just in, in, the, in the space, as if I measured the two, two values, like the expression of two genes. So the X coordinate would be one gene, the Y coordinate would be a second gene. Then you can plot the patients, and then they have colors that would be, let's say, they respond or they do not respond to the drug. And then the statistical question or the, the inference process is from this picture, can you learn a rule that then could be applied to predict the color of these patients? And so this picture is quite obvious and your brain does that all the time. That's why we call that machine learning, referencing to the brain, the capacity to learn. We observe that there is a trend to have black dots here on the upper right and white dots on the lower left. And therefore that maybe there is a rule like this one that separates the responders from the non-responders. And so if you can design this line, then in the future when, when we see a new patient, we could predict the color of the patient from its position and then decide that maybe we should give the drug to this person and not to the other one, right? So this is a well-defined problem and well-understood problem and, and this picture here is a solved problem in mathematics, in statistics. It has been solved 100 years ago. Uh, logistic regression or more recent fancy approaches, uh, decision trees, for example, solve this problem exactly. Now, when I say it's solved, it's solved especially when you have, let's say, 19 points in two dimensions. You see the 19 points, they are here, you have in 2D, it's easy. Now, if you apply this approach to the genomic data, there is a problem, which is that the genomic data are not really uh, uh, 19 patients in two dimensions. Because uh, in genomic data, typically for each patient, you don't measure two genes, but what we want is to measure a lot of things. This is why we talk of genomics, right? It's not only two proteins, it's more we can measure all the proteins, all the genes, all the mutations in DNA, images, etc. So you can imagine that uh, now a point, a patient, is not a point in 2D, but it may be a point in one million dimensions, if we measure the mutations, for example. Right? So you have conceptually the same problem as before. You have a cohort of patients, let's say black and white in the, in the sense of responders and non-responders, but now each point is not a point in 2D, it's a point in one million dimensions. And when you think of the process of finding this line that separates you know, the two types of points, in 2D it's easy because it's, it's super simple to have a line that separates these two things, but in higher dimensions there are an infinite number of ways to separate 19 points in 1 million dimensions, right? And suddenly you can show even mathematically, statistically, that the problem becomes ill-posed. There is no easy solution to separate, uh, I mean there are too many solutions in a sense to separate the black from the white and it leads to a process that we call overfitting in a sense that it's very easy to separate the ones we see but it's very hard to ensure that the rule we have found will be good for future patients because in a sense there are so many ways to separate the black from the white that you pick one of them but there is no reason why it should be a good one and why it should be the, the one that, that predicts that thing. Okay, so it's a, long, it's a long introduction for something well known which is that doing statistics in what we call in high dimension is hard when we don't have enough points and the standard situation in genomics is really this one is that we typically, we don't have 19 patients but sometimes we have 100 or 1000, sometimes 10,000 patients it sounds a lot when you are at the hospital when you say I've sequenced 10,000 people, you know, that's already a massive investment, it takes time and it's, it, these are people. But mathematically, a thousand points in a million dimensions is, is not a good news, right? It's really the situation which is hard. All right, so is it just a conceptual issue? Well, I think not, not only because there are, there are signs that something doesn't really work in, in many genomic studies we, we do or we, we publish. Just to give you... Yeah. Which cancer was it? The 19th patient. Oh, it was not a cancer, this one. So this one is a, <laughs> is a theoretical model just to illustrate the problem. Now, these are real data. So this, I, I will talk more precisely of some cancers later. This could be breast cancer. And, you know, we can have data, uh, at Curie or in public data with 
2,000 samples okay. and the respond to some judges. Can I ask yes. a naive question about sure. this? So actually, I thought that the more patients you have, if you just stayed with it within the two, the more patients actually better. Because yes. you get this, the, the yeah, curve better. Sure. So couldn't you, the machine, not you, run it always to uh, on, or on the cohort of patients from this, with the same disease and just do two to two, two at a time and then segregate it by, by this. Everybody yeah. who responds to, to is either here or here for two, you will know where to put it. So why do you need to do it in a million dimension? Well, if you do that, yeah. I mean, either you just decide by yourself that you will just focus on two genes and then you have one rule. The machine will go through every two. Okay. What you start with one, every two, th this is right. So you, ca you can do that, but then you, you, you still hit the same problem, which is that then, so suppose you pick two genes among a million, then you have a million times a million divided by two ways to do that. So, so you have many of these pictures, like 10 to the 12 such pictures. And among them, many of them will have a perfect separation. Just because you try so many, yeah. you know, it's well, a question of multiple tests. The gray area, let's say, give the five time a uh, five years relapse. Yeah. There will be patients with <coughs> four and a half, things like that, or close to five. So there will be a lot of gray area. No, less than five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what, what I what I say is that just for for just you know purely mathematical reasons, right, if right. you try okay. ten to the twelve two D plots you will have maybe 10 to the 9 with perfect separations. Yeah. Just, yeah. just because you try so many. And so then the question is, what do you do with that? So if you say, I, I try all of them and I pick the best one, then this is overfitting. You will, okay. It will look like you have found two magic genes that separate the, the patients. But when you will try a new patient, it will not work. And you will ask yourself, why? It's because you did not correct for multiple testing or you have this problem of, of having uh, too, yeah. you know, too many things to try. So we have a problem and you're going to solve it. Exactly. <laughs> but ma maybe, uh, so maybe uh, I will, before that, I will just tell you uh, that it's not only a theoretical problem. And uh, for example, uh, let's take breast cancer. So this is, a, you know, one of the, of, the, of the applications that people have looked the most about. Can we use not all genomic, but for example, gene expression data. So you now we can measure the expression of 20,000 genes. So we can map each patient in 20,000 dimensions and say, can we separate? Here, I will just show not a drug, but the, the risk of relapse, which is important when someone has breast cancer. If you can evaluate precisely the risk of relapse, then it can inform whether you should give chemotherapy or not, so it can really impact the treatment. So people have been very excited about using genomic information for that, to replace what has been done in the clinics for many years, which is to make an estimation of the risk of relapse from the age of the person or the size of the tumor, which works to some extent, but it's not super precise. Now, there are even products that, that are used in the hospital. You know, people use something called MamaPrint. It's a test that has been designed from this analysis. Uh, it's a bit of a controversial, uh, controversial issue because, uh, you know, some people say it brings a lot and some people say at the end of the day, the genomic information doesn't bring a lot. And if we look, for example, at some publication, there has been some, you know, competitions or where to, to, to assess as objectively as possible whether it works or not to use genomic data. Some people have said, let's collect lots of data. So lots here is typically a thousand or two thousand samples and ask people to predict the risk of relapse. And people typically, you know, through competition on the web, etc. And this is just what one, one example of a competition that was uh, a big one, where, uh, where people have tried to predict the risk of relapse either from genomic data or using the age of the person and the size of the tumor and a few markers. And, and here you have a summary of the results. I will not go through all the details, but vertically you have the performance, so how well it works, right? This is a score. It's a concordance index, whatever it is. So the, the higher, the better. The higher means that you have a good prediction on new samples, not on the ones you see, but on, on the future samples. And these are the different columns here are the performance of different models that were tried by different teams. And the very um, bad news here for, for me or for, for the community is that when you take the teams who just use the good old clinical factors, so the age of the person, the size of the tumor, they reached some level of performance, let's say 62. So this is the state of the art in 
1999, you know, before uh, we discovered we sequenced the human genome. Now a few teams say, let's replace that by genomic data, right? We have 20,000 genes, uh, that's wonderful. And here they are, right? So there were not too many teams here, there were two teams, but on average they reached 60%. So they lost performance compared to the good old clinical factors. This is disturbing, I would say. Now many teams say, well, you know, uh, maybe we should combine them because we have the clinical factors and let's add, in addition to that, the molecular data. And then it goes up again at a level which, in this case, is the same as clinical factors. Okay? So this is a, you know, a, a mul almost multi-billion dollar industry to design genomic tests and say we will use this test to, to predict the, the relapse. But when you look at that, the, you know, I wonder whether... <laughs> So this is why I say there is some controversy. Some, some doctors say, you know, it doesn't bring much to use the genomic test compared to what we know. Others say, yeah, it brings. And in fact, the devil is in the detail because even using clinical factors, you know, some hospitals may be using this model, which doesn't work. Some other hospitals may be using this model. So there are also ways to train differently the models. There is not a single way to do it. It's not only a Cox regression on that. But overall, the information content of genomic data doesn't seem to be, you know, very strong in this case. Something that we observed, so, so we and others have, have studied this data, what we observe is that, in fact, the performance here, for example, increases with the number of samples. So what you said is correct. When we have more samples, it works better. And what we observe is that when we have 2,000 samples, we are still increasing. So it doesn't mean that, you know, in the future it will stay so low, but it's clear that currently, even though it seems to be a lot to have 2,000 samples, and maybe we can reach 10,000 or 50,000 now, uh, th there is a, a limit in the performance, which is not due to the data. The data are here, they are nice, but which is due to the inference process, which is that we maybe it could be much better if we could train on a billion patients, but we will never have that. And for the moment, there is some limitation just for not biological reasons, not medical reasons, but statistical reasons. The inference process uh, is, is limited. That's a good question. Yeah. So uh, if you look just at the clinical data, you just said they may be using different tests or different yeah. anal analytical mm -hmm. approaches. Hasn't, haven't they used statistical, I would have thought they would have used statistical approaches to eliminate the bad approaches and, you know, to... Yeah, sure. So, so I mean, th this plot is just a raw plot of the results of a, of a competition on the web. So, you know, it's just what happens in a real life. You give some data to 50 teams and you ask them, build me a, a pretty model. So one guy will say, well, it's easy, I make a Cox regression model on this data. The other one will say, well, I will do the same, but I will transform my data by taking the interactions. Yeah. Someone else will say, I will do a survival random forest, etc." And everybody believes they have a good model. You know, on the data, they do cross-validation, they test it. But it's just now when you test it on new data, yeah. which is the performance here, you observe some strong version. Like Maybe, the, I mean, I'm, these ones are very bad, so you can yeah. suppose that you know, there were students or people who didn't know much about it and they made a mistake, maybe. But let's say overall, so the, you know, this, this level here is the standard level in this case of prescription. Uh, ideally, what you'd want to do is combine the best clinical approach with the best molecular, you know. And yes. Sure. But wow. so something I, I should say is there is, uh, I think there is also, um, you know, a problem in this kind of publication. So for example, in this publication, the conclusion surprisingly was not that, you know, uh, clinical is good enough. The conclusion was, look, many teams try to combine clinical and molecular and prior knowledge. And look who won the challenge. It's this guy. Right. And the conclusion was, therefore, there is some information in the molecular data that is not present in the, in the clinical data. Now, if you, you know, if you look from here, in terms of distribution, they don't seem different. It's just that more teams were here. So that's a case where, you know, concluding that this approach is better because the winner is here. Uh, doesn't really make sense, right? If, if you had more teams here, you would go to 60s. The same is there any significant difference between just molecular and molecular pl plus prior knowledge? So j just molecular is not a good one because nobody, I mean, there are, so in this data, there are just two points. So there is no significant ah, difference, okay. right? It, it's, I mean, here we do statistics among teams. You know, it's a way to do science now. We, we, we do open science. We, we say, let's give data to many people and do statistics, Suppose it, assuming that people, you know, are as good uh, and skilled. You just do prior knowledge what is prior without knowledge? molecular. 
sorry, so prior, prior knowledge is... Yeah, so prior knowledge is using the molecular data, but asking someone who knows about the genes what right. he thinks are the good genes. Right. So for example, it could be instead of using all the genes, I pick only the genes which I know are involved in cell cycle. Or, right. you know, I use a network or this kind of thing. So if you just use prior knowledge without the molecular aspect? No, the prior so, knowledge I mean, here, sorry, knowledge. here the prior knowledge, here is some prior knowledge used to analyze molecular data. This is in, the, in this. And it's not better than just the, the machine doing molecular data, even though it's only two points. If you compare molecular... This yeah, one? I yeah. Oh, sorry. So, the, yeah. So, you mean without, if we don't use the clinical factors, if we don't use the size of the tumor, then it's very hard to get a good model, right? I mean, these two, these two things. And here is, I just blindly train a model in 25,000 dimensions. That's one way here. And here, I say, in addition to that, maybe I should just focus on a few genes which I believe are important. And you ask doctors. And you don't do better. And there, no, it's not better. So you have all these, you know, disturbing facts, which, um, which, which contradict the intuitions sometimes of, uh, you know, why it should work, etc. But th that are here. Now, very quickly, a second disturbing fact, and this one I will spend less time. What, what is being predicted? What specific feature of cancer being predicted? So in this case, sorry, the, the goal was to predict the risk that there is a relapse the cancer. So this is breast cancer, metastasis, metastasis. metastasis. Within a certain time. Within a certain time, yeah. Uh, well, um, yes and no. I mean, th this thing is called what, uh, it's called a survival model. So, you know, for each person, we, we have a, a person that, that for which cancer was diagnosed, and then it's followed. A, a original stage where the agnosis was known. As, okay, a crucial, right, the time of diagnosis, where it was diagnosed, what stage? If, if this was... This is our early stage. Uh, so, so early, when we were little, how much advanced it was. That's a crucial point. Yeah, this crucial parameter probably beats everybody. Yeah, yeah. sure, sure. So, so, so it's enough predict by exactly. the molecular data at this stage. Exactly. So, so, I mean, you're completely right that, you know, the reason why clinical data are good is because they've been used forever because doctors have observed that, of course, when I say the size of the tumor, it's not a joke that the size of the tumor is the most predictive factor in this case. We know that if you have a small tumor compared to a big one, the risk is different. Yeah. So you should use that. And uh, what I just say is that you cannot replace it by the gene expression, even though there is signal in the gene expression. But in this case, you know, there is not, I mean, the summary is that there doesn't seem to be more signal in this plot, at least, in all the genes than in just using this, what we call the stage of the but cancer. It size, it may involve the number of particular class of cells, either it being counted or not. How many cells in this size? Some of them may be not affected. Yeah, no, so, sorry, when I talk about the size here, it's really in centimeters how big yeah. the tumor was. So you look at the tissue, they may have different composition, different yes. cells. So in, in which of the tests is being involved? This parameter is a crucial. So these parameters are not used here. Maybe they are, they are hidden in the molecular data. But, 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 but uh, histological analysis, it's not involved or not? It's not here. I mean, in well, Among the clinical data, you have you have like the expression of three proteins here. The clinical. So no, but there are pathologies. It's just clinical. A doctor who observed or somebody yeah. observed under microscope for yeah. understand that. Right. It's yeah. involved in clinical. Yes. Okay. Except that it's super summarized. Yeah. Right. The, they, they look at the image. They do many things, and they summarize that in in five numbers, mm -hmm. which is okay. does it express. Uh, estrogen receptor, does it express uh, no, no, progesterone no, no. receptor, etc. No, people histological, you look at the under microscope and you see kind of the shape and then you Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. No, I just say, I just say th this was done in the clinical data, but this is summarized in the, what we call the grade of the tumor, if you want. And the grade itself is a mixture of uh, the, the you know, number of cells in mitosis, etc. But here is just a number between one and four, right? Okay. Uh, so second observation, and this one also is completely not new, but it's still disturbing, is that in the early days of genomics, researchers have said, let's look at the genomic. So let's do what I showed previously. We have molecular data, so we can fit a model to predict the risk of relapse. And maybe we don't need to have all the genes. Maybe a few genes should be sufficient, even you know, if you're a doctor or biologist. Of course, you, nobody believes that the 20,000 genes are useful to predict the risk of relapse, right? So people have said, well, we can use nice methods to select genes and build what's called molecular signatures, meaning a subset of the genes whose expression would be enough to have a good prediction of the, the risk of relapse. 
And so as early, uh, you know, in the early 2000 years, several teams did the same things, basically. They said, let's look at breast cancer, let's look at the good genes, which allow to predict the risk of relapse. Let's publish it and let's make product. You know, I say Mama Print. Uh, this is this one. This is a product in the clinic now. What's disturbing, and, and you know, it's not new. No, everybody knows that in the field is that, for example, you have two you know, two different teams focusing on the same problem, listing their magic 70 genes or 76 genes, and when you compare the list of genes, there are three in common, right? Is it a lot or not? Well, this is what you expect if you randomly pick 70 genes out of 20,000. On average, you get three in common, right? Yeah, but this one is more specific for the lymph node metastasis. Yes. So, so this one is more general, so maybe that... So that's a good point. So you, I mean, there are many reasons why it could be... It, it's not exactly the same problem, right? It's a different kind of metastasis. It's not the same technology. It's not the same cohort. So there are many reasons why you know, it should not be the same. Now, uh, so I will not talk more about that because I want to talk about something else, but uh, we and others still were surprised by that. And so some people said, let's, for example, look just at this cohort. Here there are 300 patients. And let's simulate if there is enough power in the data, statistical power, to still discover good signatures. For example, instead of comparing this paper with this one, we just take this paper and we randomly split the cohort in two sub-cohorts. So you have 300 patients, you randomly cut it in two parts, one, 150 versus 150, and you train two signatures. So here is the same cohort, the same technology, the same endpoint, and you compare the genes. And what do you get? You get three in common. Okay? So basically, uh, and, and whatever method you use to, to select the genes, you can do a t-test, you can do complicated methods, but you never get more than that just because, and it has been also investigated and published by other teams. You compare by expression or by sequencing of the genes? What do Here it's expression. It's, but not sequencing genes, not the imitation. Not the this is a very, very old paper. This is microarray. Yeah, it was uh, in 2005. Uh, so gene expression. Yeah. But just imagine you have these, these matrices with 300 patients and uh, 20,000 genes, and just randomly split the two, estimate two signatures, in the same cohort, you get two different signatures. In fact, there were some papers showing that, for example, if you randomly pick 70 genes and build a model on that, then you get the same performance at the end, right? So, it, you know, what it means, and, and it's not really a surprise nowadays, is that you should not focus too much on the 70 genes here, on the 76 genes here, because you can pick any other subset of 70 genes, more or less, it will work the same, right? So these are not the magic genes. Now, what has been observed too and quantified is that if you don't have 300 patients, like here, but if you increase that to 500, 1,000, 2,000, then this number increases, right? Because it's purely statistical here. It's because, you know, of the correlation structure among the genes. It's just a hard problem to identify uh, with certainty some genes which have predictive signals. And, and, and the, you know, the, the, the statistical problem becomes easier with more samples. And here, you know, in terms of how many samples you have to, to fit the model and, and how, how many dimensions you have and the correction structure, it's just a situation extremely hard. And empirically, you get this kind of thing. All right, so this was a long introduction, uh, just to, to justify the fact that it's, uh, you know, there are challenges here. And in short, you know, uh, it's not enough to say I will sequence or um, do gene expression on my cohort and then I will find the good genes or will make a good model. It's a bit more complicated than that. So what I will therefore very quickly discuss, and I will, I'm sorry I spent too much time, but I think it's important to discuss that, discuss what uh, some, you know, more mathematical or abstract ways to try to, just to, to make some progress in this uh, problem, which is not biological here, it's how do you get uh, extra knowledge from these data which have a very sometimes strange geometry or uh, topology in the data. So I will discuss two things. One is about, uh, and, and they are very, very standard, but I will illustrate them on some things we did, but you know, it's, a, it's a broader topic. One is uh, showing that what we call regularization in learning is important and can be adapted to the problem. And the second is that maybe instead of you know, taking the raw data, typically when you have a patient, you say, I measure the transcriptome, so it's a vector of numbers. Maybe it's not a good representation, and maybe doing something else, like I will explain what this is, 
changes the geometry and makes the, the inference process easier. Right? The key point is that things here require some assumptions, some prior knowledge. But if you don't do them, then it, it will not work. You cannot just trust the data. We are not in the setting where there are enough data to automatically learn everything. So it really makes a difference to do something specific on the data. And of course, these are not definite answers. I mean, these are just things we did, but it's, it's many things could be done. OK, so uh, regularization and representation. So re regularization, what is it? Maybe many of you are not familiar with uh, statistics and machine learning, but it's just a concept that uh, you know, you remember when I showed the, the first picture with the points and the line? Uh, let's try to formalize a bit the process here. So the process is that uh, we have observations which are vectors. So here I have, you know, look at, at the data. So this is a, a real data, a, a zoom in uh, on some real data. So now we have samples which will be patients. So each, imagine this is a matrix of numbers representing gene expression values. So each row here is a, a person, a patient. Each column is one gene, so you have 20,000 columns, let's say a few hundred rows. And you have a response here, which is what I call the Y variable, which we'll, here we take as binary. Imagine that this is one if the patients relapse and zero if they don't relapse. So okay. This one, it's not important, but this one is breast cancer. So remember I said when we observe this data, this is, uh, this is another way to say we have points in 20 dimensions which with you know, black and white points. Let's fit a line to separate them. So a line mathematically is just a linear function. So here the goal would be say, let's try to infer a linear function in this space. So it would be just uh, if x represents a patient, it's a linear function. I, I write beta transpose x to say just a linear function, the sum of beta I, xi. And the goal is uh, to infer a beta. So beta would be, let's say, the, the slope of the line, so the direction of the, the hyperplane in this case, to try to separate uh, the, the, let's say, the, the plus one samples versus the zero samples, the two colors. OK, uh, I showed in 2D that it's easy to find a line. I said it's, so, it's a solved problem. Here it's not solved in high dimensions because there are many, many hyperplanes, many, many lines that can separate just a few points from a few other points in high dimension. So how, how do we solve that in practice? Well, the, the, the standard state of the art is to say, let's, uh, let's regularize. And regularizing means that we write an objective function. So we do some optimization, optimization over you know, the possible lines, saying that we're looking for beta. So beta is the, is, the, is the direction of the hyperplane that minimizes a sum of two terms. I will not detail what, what are the two terms, but the first term is just a term that measures how well beta separates the two, the two things. So this is you know, a measure of you know, how well uh, you separate the two things. So this is the set of things. But implicitly, you say it's Euclidean metric, which is not justified. Yeah. <laughs> which is not by no means justified. It's just out of blue air. Exactly. Yeah. Right, so, so this would be, uh, let's try to separate the data. And if you do that, I said many times it doesn't work because it's a ill post problem. There are many ways to have a perfect separation of these points in high dimension. So the solution that machine learning and statistics has found is to say, let's penalize this by a, by a second term, which would be only depending on beta. This one does not depend on the data, right? It's some kind of prior penalty we put on any classifier, any, any, any line. And if we minimize both of them, then, then if we choose correctly uh, the, the penalty here, it ends up with, with a well-posed optimization problem that will have a unique solution and will decide what is this line. OK, so this is maybe, if, if, if you never saw that before, it may be a bit abstract, but let's be concrete. What, what are the, these penalties, typically, which, which are implemented in all the softwares we use every day, you know, when you do statistical analysis? Maybe the most, the most standard two penalties are just norms. Right, so beta is a vector, and the standard uh, penalties used are the, just the Euclidean norm, squared if you want, or what's called the L1 norm, which is, so the Euclidean norm is the sum of the squared coefficients, and the L1 norm is the sum of absolute values of the coefficients. So these are two norms over uh, vectors. Here you can show in the space, if you have two dimensions, the, 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 the light blue shapes here are the the unit balls of these two norms. So you have the L2 norm is just uh, circle, L1 norm is more diamond shaped here. And so um, 
So typically, these two things are used as penalties to, to, to regularization. And if you do that, it's called, it has names, and it's called ridge regression, ridge realistic regression, support vector machines. All these uh, you know, things that work on average involve these two things. Now, what you see is that uh, I mean, these are pretty generic. It's not about biology here. There is no notion of gene whatsoever. But these are already quite, uh, quite good at ensuring that in high dimension, you have a well-posed problem, and it does something. And just uh, uh, last comment on that. So they have names. You know, the L1 norm is often called the, the lasso regression. And the L2 norm is called the ridge regression. Even though you know, they look a bit the same, they are just two norms. When you use them in practice, they end up with very, very different models. And in particular, for geometric reasons, it's known that if you penalize with the L1 norm, which is non-differentiable at some points, then the solution of the optimization, so the, your final model, will be sparse, meaning that the vector of, of weights will have many, many zeros. And you can control the number of zeros with the penalty parameter here. Whereas if you use the L2 norm as penalty, it will not be sparse. So if you translate that in terms of you know, genes, it means that this one will lead to gene selection, because at the end of the day, your model, even though if it's a model in 20,000 dimensions, will just contain a few non-zero components. This will be the selected genes. This one will be uh, non-zero everywhere. There is no gene selection. So uh, since there are probably other non-mathematicians in the audience, doesn't it worry you that you get very different results when you change this arbitrary penalty or semi-arbitrary penalty function? I mean, if you would converge to the same answer, you would say, well, it doesn't matter so much how oh, you yeah, structure yeah, sure. the penalty. Yes, so indeed. So, you know, if, if we were like uh, in the easy situation with many samples in small dimension, what we will observe is that the, two the choice of the penalty is not important and probably we would not even need a penalty. Mm -hmm. So here. Something I didn't say is that there is a, you know, a weight lambda that, say, that you, you fix, you know, that, that balances how much penalty you put compared to how much you, you believe in the data. So in easy situations, all the penalties converge to the same solution, which should be the ones you get without penalties. And indeed, as you say, in the situation where we are in genomics, where we need to penalize, then you get very different solutions. When you look at you know, the, the vectors, they are very, very different except there is no statistical way to say one is better than the others. And here we enter the, the, you know, the field where we have to make bets or prior assumptions and typically ask, uh, assume that we believe that a good model should be sparse. Well, this you know, huge area depends on how many parameters, square root of n. In inevitable error in all these dimensions, square root of n. So error in misunderstanding grows with dimension pitch effects. So I think it is a big problem with all these methods. Yeah, they, yeah. Ad hoc, ad hoc models, and sometimes they miraculously they work. Yeah. There is no reason why they should work. Yeah, I mean it's so. So a key question. No, no, an obvious question is okay. In, in, in genomics, should you use the L1 or L2 ones? Anybody yeah, else? Trying to choose to see which one will fit better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To separate. Yes. But none of them may work. I mean, this no? is a confusing point. You have to invent the right, the, the right way. Yes. Invent them. You take them from textbooks because people use them. It's absolutely no justification. That's yeah. It. Yeah, and, and in fact, you know, I just put L1, L2, you can imagine any norm is, is yeah, most random. You choose two random numbers, I'm sorry, you have to use, invent something better. Yeah. Yes. So, for example, and, and, and so what I want to illustrate is that in addition to that, the reason, I mean, whether L1 or L2 or something will work is sometimes very non-intuitive. And so, for example, let's say the example of our breast cancer prognosis, right? So we have breast cancer, we want to fit a model, so I say you need to regularize. Take a textbook and they say, well, there are two nice ways. You can do lasso regression, you can do ridge regression, etc. And lasso is due to a signature selection of genes. So I think there is a consensus in, in the, among biologists or doctors that probably the, the, if there was a true model, like uh, if we had enough data, probably the true model would be sparse. Because we don't believe that all the genes have predictive signal. It should contain a few things. This is a nice idea. So if you translate that into you know, our inference problem, it would suggest that probably L1, if you had to, to choose, maybe a better one because L1 will lead to a sparse model and L2 will not. And so that's why that's what everybody did. Like, you know, I, I mentioned the MAMA print or the gene signature with 70 genes. It was done. It was not less, so it was even simpler, gene, you know, one by one selection, but it was based on the assumption that 
there is no need to have all the genes, a few should be enough. Now if you test that on, on data, surprisingly, uh, I will not explain the details, but you, you, you can plot, you know, do experiments where you plot some performance of your model, so it's, you know, like ways you have data, you train uh, on a subset of the data, and then you test on some other subset to evaluate the, the generalization performance. And we can compare models which are based on a few genes or on all the genes with rich regression. And if you plot the performance as a function of how many genes you have in your model, so typically, you know, you, you balance lasso and reach, and you say, I can make a signature with 70 genes, which is the standard in, in, in this field, I get a performance, or maybe I can add more, but I need to regularize with L2, so you did correctly. And what you observe is that, in fact, in this case, the performance just increases with more genes, right? And it's, uh, it's also a disappointing uh, observation that focusing on 70 gene signatures gives you some signal, which is not too bad, but the performance will be better if, if you kept all the genes. So this thing is not intuitive because, there, you know, if we had converged to a true model, Marcef, I don't believe we should need all the genes. But something happens here, which is just that because we don't have many samples and because of many things we don't understand, empirically, is the other regularization that gives better performance. And probably this, this has to do with the fact that, it's, you know, I said that it's very hard to be consistent in the gene selection. Sometimes when you pick 70 genes in some data, you, you, you end up with 70 other genes on the data. And this, you know, lack of uh, robustness probably is related to the fact that the performance is not optimal and that it's better because it's hard to choose the good ones to just keep all of them and just apply a penalty that, that allows you to learn in high dimension uh, even though you, don't, you are not sparse. I think it's true because, because that some gene may be not specific for cancer, but, because, but, they, but they may involve production of ribosomes, yeah, and therefore it may be very, very sensitive. There may be very, it's a lot of gene not directly related but highly expressed, and so they will give this effect. Not because they're so yeah. important, but because they express in large quantities. Yeah, sure. Right? I mean, but, but, you know, this is... That's also important. It's, it's, it's not clear. The only thing that we can test is... I mean, me no, at least no, is the performance, yeah, and we just measure expression. It's absolute expression or relative co compared to the to the healthy tissue. So mm -hmm. what you put, just put normalized numbers, you completely different result. In this case, this where let's say the absolute expressions, even though absolute means that they have been processed by some yeah, no, pre-processing. Normalized by the by, by the by the control, right? Yeah. yeah. And then I, I need to intervene from now on. <laughs> We'll ask only short questions, okay? <laughs> no, Otherwise, we will never finish. Thank you. Short question. Yes. Uh, if, if I went into your data and uh, mislabeled a few patients, uh, wouldn't that... Uh, so you're trying to learn from the data with a little bit of noise in yeah. labels of patients. Yeah. Wouldn't that look... You mean the performance would decrease or...? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, the, the, the noise in the labels in general is something... I mean, all, all the methods that, that we work with are supposed to run with noise in the data. Right? So, in a sense, the picture when I had the, the black and the white was not the, the correct one. Here, you know, when I say, uh, if I come back here, we balance a sum of two terms. One is how well we fit the data, and the second is how good we are with respect to our prior knowledge or prior hypothesis. And here, the fit to the data does not impose that you make no error. You know, it's, it says, well, we can accept errors, and sometimes it's better to make a few errors on the training set if we, if we get a, a better penalty. For I'm not talking about the errors of your algorithm. It's I'm a long question about already. <laughs> Ask him later. Yeah, it's already long. You're trying Sorry. to fit the mistake. Yeah. No, I don't say it's good to fit a mistake, but we all know that uh, the, you know, uh, the, 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 the mistakes are part of what I call the noise in the training data. But then we can follow up in the, in the coffee. Okay, so I understand I have to, to, to speed up a bit and I will not have uh, long questions anymore. So what I wanted to say is that, you know, here uh, something happens, it's needed to do that. Uh, it's sometimes counterintuitive to know what penalty works or doesn't work. And so some people, our group and many others, have said that maybe if we are confronted with genomic data for which we know a lot of things, we know the genes, we know r the ribosomes, cell cycle, etc., maybe it's possible to use this prior knowledge to design different penalties, a bit less naive than that, because this one, you know, you have gene one, gene two, it's uh, isotropic in all di directions. And so things that, that, uh, that we have proposed, for example, uh, and others, are, for example, if 
if you know a, a gene network, like if, as a prior knowledge, you have, you know that some genes, this, this, this one is a picture of a protein network, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, for my purpose, uh, I just say that you have genes and, and connections that could be physical interactions, that could be uh, pathways, that could be many things. Could this knowledge be put in the prior so that you, you can drive the selection of models, let's say, to be compatible or coherent with what you believe happens in the cell? And if you're correct, this may be a way to help the inference process, right? In a sense, you, you could reduce dimension focusing on what you want. Except that here, let's say you have a, net, a graph, uh, and you want to use that to constrain your model. How can you do that? Well, these are, you know, a few examples of penalties where the structure of the graph enters a definition of a penalty. So all these ones are functions of beta. So beta would be a candidate model. Then for each candidate model, you can quantify something. So this is to replace the L1 or the L2 norms, right? And then you could say, maybe I can use these penalties, put it in the optimization, and this gives me my inference model where at the end of the day, I will try to fit a model that explains the data and is small in terms of these penalties. So what are these penalties? I won't have time to detail all of them. Maybe I will just illustrate the weirdest one. I mean, uh, I mean, I know there is heterogeneous level in mathematics in the room, but uh, for many people, this one is a bit strange to, to grab. Like if you have a beta, I say a penalty, a norm for beta would be the supremum over alphas, such that alpha i squared plus alpha j squared is more than one for connected genes of alpha transpose beta. What is that? It's a bit ugly. It doesn't seem to make sense uh, for many people. But in fact, this one can be illustrated as follows. So this is the, the penalty I was referring to. It's just a variational form of a norm that is just a convex hull in high dimension. So what do I mean? Uh, imagine, so here we live in the space of, you know, the dimension of the space is the number of genes. So it's not two, it's 20,000. And what we do is that we, we design a shape in 20,000 dimensions in this case, just by saying that when you have a gene network, so you take all pairs of genes which are connected. For example, suppose you have five genes here. You take the pair one, four, these are two genes. They are connected. And therefore, what you do in this case is that in the high dimensional space, you just draw a circle with unit uh, radius in the subspace corresponding to dimensions one and four. Right, so you are, you are in high dimension, and, but you can focus on just two dimensions, dimensions 1, 4, you draw a circle. And then you do that for gene 1, 4, then you do that for all the pairs, 2, 4, you draw another circle, uh, 4, 3, you draw another circle, and you end up with many, you know, two-dimensional circles. And then you take just the convex hull, and the convex hull is just the smallest, you know, shape, convex shape, that contains the circle. So this picture just shows what would happen if you have two circles in 3D. Here you have a horizontal circle, a vertical circle, and the convex hull, you know, is like the Chinese lantern that uh, fits the circles, but not more. Right, so if you do that, then uh, the, the, this defines a, a, a norm, like you can take this as, as the unit ball of a norm, and this equation is just the definition of this norm, right? And so now you can put this norm instead of the L1 norm or instead of the L2 norm that I said before. And if you do that, if you analyze a bit the situation, what would happen is that because the shape is non-differentiable in some specific circles, you can show that it will lead to a selection of the gene. So when you, you know, minimize, you, you estimate a model beta, and the solution beta will have many zeros, just like the lasso. But among the non-zeros, so the genes which are selected, you will see that many of them are connected on the graph. And the reason being that the solution, you know, will be on some of the circles which correspond to the fact that two connected genes are non-zero. Right, so this is just a way, you know, to change a bit the penalty by putting prior knowledge and, and pushing the solution towards not only, let's say, selection of 70 genes, but hopefully selection of 70 genes that tend to be connected on our network. Right, we, we change a bit the, we put a little bit. No, half genes will influence a lot, which may be specific, right, because you know there are these huge connections. Yeah. And they may have way machine yeah, and, that's you, a and you inference on that, yeah? Yeah, that's a very good point, yeah. So here, I, I, I mean, a variant would be to have weights, etc. but this is a very important uh, question that, that is, we don't have any satisfactory answer to that. Just to illustrate, let's take back our breast cancer data, you know, uh, and, 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 and compare, for example, uh, 
compare what would be a, a, a signature, so a selection of, here I think there are just 60 genes, if you use a lasso, so this is, let's say, a, a standard and state-of-the-art method to say I have, I start from all the genes, I select 60 genes, here they are, so you have many genes, and then if you map them back to a network to analyze them, to try to say what, are the, what is the signature, then you, you would observe that a few of them tend to be connected. So here you, you have your uh, ribosomal proteins, by the way, and, and they show very strongly as six connected genes, so you can start to get some interpretation, like it seems that ribosomes may be involved, etc. But many, many other ones are not connected, so it's a bit harder to interpret. Now if you replace that and you get performance of 61, if you replace that by, you know, this just changing the, the norm from L1 to this uh, convex shape, you get different signatures. And it's not a surprise, but of course the signature is more connected because you have put the, the knowledge of the graph in the, uh, in the penalty. So these are the 60 other genes. And suddenly you have bigger connected components, like, the, the, you know, your ribosome proteins are extended to a bigger sub-network sub or pathway you see up here a second big component, which are cell cycle genes, and a few other ones, right? So here, you know, it's hard to say it's better because you put the knowledge of the graph and therefore it's mathematically uh, obvious that you would get more connections, it's what you designed. So it's hard, you know, to, to, to assess whether this is really a good news that you observe that, you had to observe that. What we can observe is that sometimes it's hard, but sometimes the performance slightly increases. Here, I you know, I don't put the error bars, etc. but you tend to have some slight increase in the performance, which may be a good sign that, you know, choosing different penalties could have some impact. And in particular here, using some prior knowledge may, may drive you to more, more realistic models, which may be more stable and also lead to better performance. All right, uh, there are other penalties, but I will not discuss them because I just want to say one word about uh, you know, I said there are two parts in my talk. One is regularized, so I hope I explain what it means and, and that there is possibility to define penalties. Uh, a second one is, is also to say, you know, maybe we are just stupid to say because someone measured 20,000 numbers, we should put that directly in our linear model, right? Because uh, as you say, the geometry here, we, we, we say these are numbers, therefore these are vectors, and I use a linear model. There is a, a very uh, strong assumption here and, and very uh, some strong naivety in, in, in believing that this is a good, uh, a good geometry that we're... Uh, the algorithm is more obvious, right? The yeah. algorithm is more obvious. You, you, you use that multiplicity. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But so, the, so for example, and, and for example, I would just illustrate on, on, on one concrete case why, why we know that is very uh, naive. So for example, you know, I've been showing this, this image many times. So I said these are like data you can collect. These are real data, gene expression data. But in fact, these are not the data that come out from the machine. For example, here, if we talk of microarrays, it's the same for sequencing. What comes out from the machine is first pre-processed by many things because we know that you have technical effects, you have batch effects, you have, you know, uh, sequencing differences in sequencing depth, etc. So before coming to this matrix, in fact, there's a lot of things going on. And one thing, for example, that is maybe one of the most standard pre-processing step, like in, uh, in, in for people working in, in expression in, in macroarrays, is implementing the RMA package in R, which is one of the most popular one, is that uh, if, if, you do, you know, if you do some biological experiment where you measure gene expression over the same sample many times in different days of the week with different uh, people, you get different numbers. Right, for many reasons. The weather changes, the, the, you know, it's very hard. So typically, uh, it's not that these, these are just unwanted variations, right? These are variations due to technical effects and you don't believe it's biology. So to remove these effects, someone has to do some normalization at, at, as a preprocessing. And typically, one, one thing which is done is called quantile normalization. It's a transform that given, so imagine that here, X, each box plot would be one sample it's a distribution of gene expression over one sample. Usually you don't take the, the raw values, you normalize them so that at the end of the day, when you have many samples, you more or less have the same values. So not in the same order, right? It's not the same genes which have the same values, but if you look at the distribution of values across each sample, it ends up being the same. This is called quantile normalization, right? Now what this says is that in fact, what you kept from the original data, the original signal, it's not really the values, it's just the 
relative order of the genes. Because when you move from the raw data to the data you will use in your models, uh, it's just the order that has been kept. And then from the order, you define the new values that are constrained to follow a particular distribution. Right? So, so what can you say from that? Well, a few things. So first, uh, the, the thing I will, uh, again, I will be uh, short now. One question is, uh, you know, here I say you transform your data so that at the end they have all the same distribution. First, it's not here what should be the final distribution. It's a bit arbitrary, right? You could say it could be, you could impose that to be a Gaussian distribution, a uniform distribution, an empirical average. There are many choices possible. And there is no clear reason why you should decide one or the other. So for example, something we, you know, these are different possible distributions. So something we worked on with, with a student of mine is to say that maybe this thing could be optimized, and I don't have time to explain, but it's possible mathematically, uh, don't look at the equations, but not only to say I first transform and then I fit a model, but you could say I transform and I fit a model and I optimize both the transformation in terms of the target distribution and the vector beta that defines the model. Right? So in short, there are uh, it's a joint optimization of a, a model. Sorry, I changed from beta to w, but it's just a linear model. And the parameter of the transformation. Okay, so it's possible to do. Uh, and, and the interesting uh, byproduct of that is that when you do that, you need to clarify what's the link between the target distribution and your optimization problem. And in fact, there is a simple link which goes through a first representation of your each sample. So imagine this is one, one patient, one vector of expression. Then what you, I said the information you keep from this, uh, from this sample is, is not the values, in fact, you will change the values. It's the relative order of the gene. So it's what's called a permutation in mathematics. You know, it's, a, it's a ranking of the things. And so in our case, uh, the, the way we represent this thing is through a <coughs> what's called a permutation matrix. It's a binary matrix that indicates what is the position of each gene, right? So in each, you know, in each column corresponds to a gene and each row corresponds to a rank. And you can show that if you replace a vector of expression like that by this matrix, then this is what corresponds exactly to, um, sorry, I'm asking you the details, to optimizing both the model and the, the target distribution, right? So I don't want to go to the details of that, but the, for me, the important lesson here uh, and, you know, somehow it works. But the important lesson here is that to make this work, what we have done and what, what we do sometimes without re realizing it is that when we use gene expression data, in fact, we don't really use the values that were measured. We first transform gene expression into a permutation. So we move to a discrete setting, right? The space of permutation is called a symmetry group. And then when you have, let's say, a thousand samples, it means you have a thousand permutations. And then you learn from that. So it's a new representation. And you know, one way to do is, is to do what, what I presented, meaning that from the permutation, we remap to the space of vectors, and then we make a linear model. But maybe you don't have to do that. Maybe you can directly say, what about, sorry, what about designing algorithms or methods or ideas that directly work on the symmetry group? So it raises the question of, can you learn on the symmetry group? And in fact, many people you know, do that and are excited by that, right? So, in short, uh, even though uh, we believe that we work wi with vectors of numbers that were measured, in fact, there is something in between that, that happens in many cases, which is working on a symmetry group. And just as an idea, maybe it's possible uh, to, to directly start from here and, and design, uh, you know, new approaches based on doing something. So here the question is, suppose you want to make a linear model uh, you need to define what is a linear model over the symmetry group. Of course, mathematics has a lot of tools for that, but uh, it's not, it's not uh, it's completely not like a strange sorting problem, no? Not, I mean, it maybe it can be formalized this way, but it's not obvious. Okay, so, uh, so I think I, I will just stop here, uh, you know, because I have still a, a long thing. Uh, I could talk more, but obviously I don't have time to. But just, uh, just as, as a teaser, maybe, uh, the, the last thing I want to, to mention quickly is that I talked a lot about uh, gene expression data, but there are many other data, like for example, uh, we can look at, at these types of data which are uh, more discrete and which again for cancer, so here not many cancers, but this is a picture on breast cancer, which don't indicate the expression of the genes, but which indicate the mutations in DNA. 
right? So you could say, well, now I look at the genome of the tumor, I compare the, the tumor to the normal sample, make a difference, and I observe that some genes are mutated in a tumor. So maybe just looking for a given patient which genes are mutated, it can help me predict the risk of relapse or predict the response to a therapy. <coughs> but here again, we have the same problem that we want to use that as input to fit a model. And it's again high dimensional. And there is something more here, which is that you see just from this picture that you know, these, are, these are not just random vectors in high dimensions. It's a binary matrix with 99% of zeros. When you take two samples randomly, they are basically orthogonal. They, they have no gene in common, maybe one, P53, but overall it's very hard. So again, there is a very strange or complicated geometry structure, which makes that if you directly say, I take that and I, I fit a model, Cox regression, if you want to predict survival or something else, it just doesn't work well. And so some people, uh, we and others, with Andre uh, Zinoviev in particular, have, 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 thi have you know, investigated maybe it's possible to change the representation, say that instead of having a big binary vector, we should represent our sample by something else. So we propose something using a network again. I, I don't have time to explain, but to make a long story short, it's, it's possible to replace the original representation by another representation, such that at the end, maybe this is the only thing I, I can show, uh, you can test, you know, uh, empirically, when you have different ways to represent your data and you fit a model, how well they work. Overall, these are different cancers, the performance is not good, but the only thing I want to show is that in some cases, just changing the representation from the raw data to another one to another one has an impact on the performance. So here is the same data, is the same learning model. The only thing we change is, do we start from a big binary vector like this? Do we start from a transformation, etc.? And sometimes there is a significant difference in how well it works. Right? So just to say that this is also a domain in high dimension with few samples, and your initial choices of representations or regularization matter. Right, they matter because they change the, the final performance of your model. So it's really worth thinking about it. We don't, I don't have any, you know, secret or uh, it's all very empirical and based on assumptions we try. But it's a field that 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 requires, you know, I think there is still a lot of room for improvement in in how, for example, to represent a profile of mutation. All right, I will I will stop here, and I'm really sorry to uh, to to be so long. But um, in conclusion, my you know my message is just that. There are challenges in trying to extract knowledge from genomic data, and many challenges are not biological or medical, they are just mathematical, statistical. Uh, I mentioned regularization and representation as two ways. Uh, they are not independent, of course, to, to try to do something. And more importantly, I think there is really a subtle interplay between you know, knowledge and biology, on the one hand, and how we can put that in the mathematical or computational framework. And the intuitions for why one representation works or not is, is often a mix between biological reasons and purely mathematical reasons. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one or two questions. That's it. Okay. So uh, for biologists, it's obviously very worrisome that the mathematics that you do with the data give you different answers. And the question I'd like to answer, ask, and I'm not sure if there's an answer, is is the reason why the processing, the mathematics, is so critical is because the quality of the data isn't good, or is it because the complexity of the problem is very high? Well, I guess, I guess it's a mixture of both. So I, I insisted not on the, on the quality of data. I just insisted on even the, if, if the data were perfect, on just the fact that, you, you know, for example, you are in two high dimension and just a few samples, or equivalently, you know, the, the, the so it corresponds to your second hypothesis, the fact that the model is too hard to learn, meaning that learning uh, even a linear model in high dimensions is hard, independently on the noise. Now, the fact that you have noise doesn't help. I think more or less, I mean, for me, I, I consider that as additive problems, like, uh, Having noise makes the problem hard, and having high dimensions makes the problem hard, and you know the difficulty is somehow the sum of the two. So you would, it's easier if you have less noisy data and if you have more data in, in lower dimension. Um, so 
uh, I happen to uh, routinely deal with uh, you know, lasso models, and my experience with the data is prediction doesn't work. You look at which cases are hard to predict. There are usually a few bad apples. You throw those out, everything works beautifully. And then if you zoom into these bad apples, you can justify it. Usually it's obvious, you know, error of, of class Outliers. label. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this guy actually died uh, and uh, didn't survive. Um, I'm just wondering if in your experience there's, you know, some... Yeah, so, so I would say this happens all the time and, and I completely agree with you that, you know, in all, even in all what I presented, in fact, I completely uh, didn't talk about some other preprocessing, which is typically that we will move outliers, this kind of thing, right? Now, this being said, I, I, I don't really agree on the, on the, I mean, you didn't claim that, but the, the fact that once you do that, then the <coughs> problem is solved. Then we enter the world of the, the other problem, which is that, okay, even if, if there is no outlier and no noise in the data, we still have to, you know, to learn a big model. And lasso in high dimension is not robust, for example. If you select the genes, they will just not be the same, even if you remove outliers. But I fully agree with you that, practically speaking, th this is very important to, uh, to not to blindly apply these techniques to, to data, but just check what are the data. You always do a PCA, you visualize your data, and you do something. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And you are now, um